welcome to anu's classroom this video is dedicated to discussing the assignment solutions of mmpc 3 this is applicable for those who are submitting the assignments along with the july 2024 batch or the january 2025 batch i am anu i will be your guide and facilitator for this session and if you are new you are right now seeing a video offering from anu's classroom it is a channel that is aimed at providing quality content aimed at helping igno mba students navigate the coursework and come out as efficient managers without the limitations of distance learning. In the hope that this video will be useful to you in your learning journey, let us look at the assignment in detail. As you know, IGNO expects us to write this assignment after we complete at least one round of reading and understanding of all the topics that are covered in the course. If you have done that, congratulations. And if you have not, don't worry. I have a rapid roundup of MMPC3 which covers all the units of the course already available in the channel. So you can go and read it, sorry you can view it, it hardly takes 2 hours and you will get an overview of the complete course without having to read the whole book cover to cover. I highly recommend seeing that rapid roundup before proceeding with writing your answers and if you are interested then you can find the link to the same in the description box below. Your assignment solution booklet should have a cover page which will include details like your name, enrollment number, address, phone number and email id along with the date on which you are submitting and your signature. The second part is about your program. So or uh, rather this particular assignments details like your program code, your course code, the course title, what is your what is the assignment number and the study center. Then from the second page onwards you can start writing your answer. I have seen some people pay, uh, attaching the printed printout of the assignment question paper along with the answer sheet that is allowed or but it is not mandatory or you can write down each question along with your answer so like write down the question and then write the answer then the next question and then the, uh, its answer like that also you can write it is not mandatory but it is okay if you pay, uh, have a printout of your assignment uh, pay, uh, question paper along with this answer booklet you can either write a uh, this assignment on uh, A4 ruled paper or A4 unruled paper that is also up to you. You have to either use a blue pen or a black pen but make sure whichever color you are choosing use the same color throughout. Don't write one answer in black and the other answer in blue. That will not work. Okay. Mm, and you can also write on one side or on both sides that of the paper that is also up to you i suggest you give a margin of one or one and a half centimeters on all sides of the page that way even if the sides of the page you might get you know torn and all while shipping or while they're handling and things like that so even if they get torn a little bit on the sides your answer will still be intact that is why i'm suggesting it is a good idea to leave at least one or one and a half centimeters of margin on all sides of the page now that said, the assignment question paper for MMPC 5 has, uh, sorry, MMPC 3 has 5 questions in total covering all the blocks of this course. And it is assumed that each question will be of equal weightage. Since the assignments are usually evaluated out of 100, each question may be around 20 marks. Now to get 20 marks in your assignment or later on in your term and examination also, you have to write at least 500 to 600 words. For a person with an average sized handwriting, this will come about uh, 3 to 4 pages if you write on one side of the paper or approximately 2 sheets of paper if you write it on 2 sides. On both the sides of the paper, it will come around 2 papers or if you are choosing to write only on single side, it will be around 3 to 4 pages. Personally, I prefer writing on both sides of the paper because it reduces the number of pages which, you, which will also reduce your cost of shipping in case you decide to send your assignments to your study sender via post. Okay, so I have a sample assignment cover page template provided in the website for you to print and use if you if you are interested in or if you are looking for one uh, and the web link to the website you will get it in the channel description not in the co in this video's description but rather in the Anus classroom channel description. Okay, it is not mandatory to follow the same template style but uh, just make sure that all the details that we had mentioned earlier right your name program code blah 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 all those things all of those details have to be there you can choose to follow any template that you choose okay now while you're filling out the details on the cover page you may have some doubts and though most of the details can be found from the assignment question paper or your admit card and all i will just give you a shot on uh, the basic uh, course details that you have to fill your personal details anyway you will know 
right so program code is the name of the program that you are studying like for example if you are looking at this course uh, or this video as part of your mba in hr management then your program code will be mba hr management if you are doing a pgdm then it will be pgdm in whatever thing okay so that will be your program code course code is mmpc3 this for this particular assignment course title is business environment the assignment code i have given in the screen you can copy that i got this thing from your assignment question paper okay so you will find this in your assignment question paper itself and a study center is your study center's code like for example if you have chosen uh, sn college which is under rc kochi then their study center code will be 1405 i believe this code you will find from your ignos admit card at uh, id card okay so you have to write that now before we start our discussion i want to take a moment and remind you of how important and how easy it is to score good marks in your assignment because unlike your term and examination where you are given a paper you are in a controlled environment you have to rely on your memory retention skills to write the answer it is not the same in assignments right because you are allowed to have your books open while you write answer you are allowed to use additional resources from google or elsewhere to form an understanding of the concepts that are asked in the assignment questions so unlike your term and examination that is why i said you can have your textbook or any kind of article open to refer when you are preparing your answers so make use of that opportunity okay and make use of it and try to score a grades now even say for example you you might be thinking i oh, know it is so easy for you to say but i have a lot of things on my plate already and i can't dedicate that much of time writing an assignment so maybe you might be thinking of buying a bulk assignment or sometimes even handwritten assignments i would generally uh, uh, you know speak against uh, uh, buying handwritten assignments and submitting that is a big no no because uh, the, okay if you are just behind a fancy paper slip from igno at the end of 2 years then maybe it is okay for you but uh, it it will not do any good for you when it comes to term and examination we cannot buy term and examination answer scripts handwritten right we have to write it so buy bulk assignments but even if you are deciding to simply buy bulk assignments uh, don't simply copy paste it in your handwriting and submit it okay read through what they have written sometimes i have seen certain uh, assignment answer scripts have written blunders like it is not at all about the question that is being asked okay so read through the solutions that you have purchased understand what they are writing have a judgment on whether the answer is actually right or not how to have that judgment you need to know what is said in the topic said in the course that is why i have prepared the rapid round up video it will help you get an overview of the entire course uh, it will be helpful even uh, for a quick revision quick round up before your term and examination as well so at least if you see that you will get to know whether what the question asked and the answer given is proper or not in the bulk assignment you are buying right so read through whatever solutions you have got this i am saying if in case you are buying bulk assignments okay understand what they have given as answer and try to modify that answer and make it your own okay add your own examples or change uh, something the wording or something like that and uh, represent the concept in your own way okay if possible uh, try to add pictures or diagrams or tables something like that and make them unique uh, because you see your if you are decide if you are writing your own answers i would say hats off to you that is the best decision that you can do but if you are buying bulk assignments just think the same vendor might be selling for to hundreds or thousands of other igno mba students it could happen that the same invigilator itself is getting the same answer 10 times right so don't fall for that if you do then that is when your assignment grades also comes down okay so now if you are getting an a grade in assignment if you will not have to worry about whether you passed or not even if you are getting c grade or d grade you know how many uh, queries we get every after every term and examination results are announced ma'am i got c grade in assignment i am getting d grade in term and examination did i pass or not why are you keeping your life uh, in you know in that kind of a question mark when you are allowed to use all these resources and i am providing all i am taking all this pain to give you the resources so that you get a grades right if you get an a grade in your assignment you just have to pass in your term and examination that's it just 40 marks for passing in term and examination you get that two questions or three questions if you get three questions right in your term and examination you're set for the semester okay so that is why i know you might already be knowing it but again since you guys are in the first semester i thought i'll reiterate this once again and drive home how important it is to write your assignment answers okay so 
anyways uh, without much ado let us start our discussion now the very first question of our mmpc3 assignment has two parts the first part is to describe about the circular flow of income and expenditure while the second part is to discuss how the three sector model is different from the four sector model now the answer to this question lies in the very first unit of mmpc3 okay if you can read it through it will be great or else there is a entire mmpc3 dedicated playlist with anus classroom on top of the rapid roundup videos which in which i have taken every unit and explained okay so there is a uh, there is a dedicated video for unit 1 also where all the concepts in unit 1 are explained either you can use that or you can read your unit 1 whatever way it is but go through it and then start writing your answer okay it will hardly take half hour this unit 1 uh, dedicated video i'll leave a link to the mmpc3 playlist as well in this particular video's description box so that you can go and uh, go through it okay so anyways let us see how we can write answer to this particular question now i always like to structure my answers into three sections minimum three sections so there will first be an introduction which will make up around 25% or so of my answer 20 to 25% of my answer will be the introduction it is in this introduction where i set the stage for my next section which is the main answer this will take up mostly around 70 to 75% of my answer okay and then in the end i will give a hardly a 5% conclusion one or two lines conclusion which is more or less aimed at tying everything together in its place and you know winding up so this is something which i have ever uh, which i have done ever since my school days uh, every answer i write or i suggest people to write is usually structured in this way and it has uh, helped me a lot also in scoring good grades all throughout uh, starting from my schooling so that is why i am suggesting you also follow the same now since this question has two parts and each then therefore each part of the question can have one introduction the main answer and a small conclusion it will be fine okay so now coming to the first part of the question the first part is about the circular flow of income now what is circular flow of income and expenditure the circular flow of income and expenditure is a fundamental economic concept which illustrates the flow of money and goods and services in an economy okay so it basically demonstrates how households businesses and uh, in circular flow of income it is the households and businesses who interact through exchange of money and resources now in its simplest form the circular flow uh, model consists of two main components and that is why this is also called as the two uh, sector model okay on one side of the model we have the household the household provides factors of production like land labor capital and entrepreneurship to the second model or the second side of the model which is the business in exchange for income in the form of wages or rent or interest or profits now this income is again used by the household to purchase goods and services from the business thereby we have a complete flow of goods and services okay so that is from the household aspect on the other side of the model we said there is businesses what will businesses do businesses will use the income that they receive from selling the goods and services to these households to pay for the factors of production that they are using like the wages to their workers the rent for the land they are using interest on borrowed capital or profits to entrepreneurs additionally businesses will also pay taxes to the government and the government in turn will provide public goods and services like infrastructure or national defense or transfer and payments to household okay so that is a uh, uh, in circular flow you don't have to talk about the government government will come in the three sector model okay so anyway in when you are talking about the circular flow the main pro, uh, players will be households and the firms firms are nothing but the businesses so that is why i said earlier it is a two sector model now the second part of the question was about the three sector model versus the four sector model right so you take circular flow and you add government into the mix okay so first we had the households and the firms now you add third component or the third side of the model which is government now you got three sector model so circular flow plus the government is the three sector model so that is why i said if we expand the circular model to include the government sector then it is called as the three sector model okay now in the three sector model we have the government sector okay it plays a role in the economy by collecting taxes from the households as well as the business and what they will do or what are they supposed to do they will provide public goods and services okay so this model accounts for the government spending and taxation which affects the flow of income and expenditure in the economy now you take this three sector model which has circular flow and government and you add the rest of the world okay that is the foreign sector 
you get the four sector model okay so this takes into account the international trade that is why i said the rest of the world okay so in this model the economy will be interacting also not just with households firms and government but also with the rest of the world through exports and imports of goods and services so this will introduce or this four sector model introduces a concept called as balance of payments okay which includes the current account and the capital account so that is about the three sector model and the four sector model and circular flow in short okay i am not going in depth on all of these if required as i said it is there in unit 1 it is there also in the detailed video so I, this is just a guidance video that is why i am just giving you a overview of whatever concepts are being discussed here okay so you can summarize like uh, how the three sector model differs from the four sector model or what is the circular flow like for example if you talk about the circular flow you can conclude by saying that it shows the interaction between the different economic agents in the economy the basic economic agents in the economy similarly uh, the three sector model how it differs from the four sector model is that the former that is the three sector model it includes the government sector while the latter includes both the government and the foreign sectors now whichever model be it three sector four sector or two sector each model provides a more comprehensive understanding of the flow of income and expenditure in an economy taking into account the additional factors and the interactions that influence the economic activity so the basic model is the circular flow model to the two sector model that is on top of that when you add government we get the three sector model on top of that when you add the rest of the world we get the four sector model so that is why each model it it is providing a more comprehensive understanding of how the flow of income and expenditure happens in an economy right so that is about circular flow and the three sector model and the four sector model i hope you got a generic idea and that you are now prepared to look at how we can answer the question much better let's move on to the next section or the next question so here we have to examine the working of the capital market along with its various instruments and intermediaries now if you are a, from the commerce background then definitely you will know what capital markets are what are its various instruments and intermediaries but if you are not from the commerce background if you are a science student if you were a science student or an art student or somebody who act, had uh, economics but have lost touch and you're seeing you're starting to write the assignment right now without going through any any other resources provided then uh, i want you to know that this is a topic which is dealt with in unit 5 of mmpc3 okay so either you read through unit 5 or you go and see from the mmpc3 playlist the video for unit 5 okay so uh, i have given the link to the what you can say i have given the link to this uh, videos in the description box below you can click on it and you can watch it at your convenience but i strongly suggest you do so before you start writing your answer okay along with that i will also be explaining all these things here but it will be in short okay so let us see what capital markets are first of all so the capital market is uh, what you can say it is one of the uh, two uh, markets financial markets that operate and the capital market plays a very critical role in facilitating long term financing for businesses and governments enabling them to raise funds for expansion or investment or infrastructure development so this encompasses a wide range of instruments and intermediaries which contribute to the efficient functioning of our markets so what are few of the instruments of capital market that we have to be aware of one is equity share okay equity shares represent ownership in a company and they entitle shareholders to a portion of the company's profits they are traded on stock exchanges and they provide investors with the potential for capital appreciation and dividends equity financing through the issuance of shares enables companies to raise funds without incurring any debt obligations the second type of instrument is debt instruments debt instruments you can think of like corporate bonds or government securities or debentures and all these are fixed income securities which represent a loan that is provided by the investor to the issuer okay so these instruments offer regular interest payments and the payment of the principal amount at maturity they also serve as sources of long term financing for corporations and governments allowing them to fund projects and operations the third kind of instrument that we need to know about is derivatives derivatives include futures and options okay so these are financial contracts whose value is derived from an underlying asset like 
stocks or commodities or indices. They enable investors to hedge against price fluctuations, speculate on future market movements and manage risk. Derivatives play a crucial role in providing liquidity and precise discovery in the capital market. So these are few of the instruments. There are many more instruments in capital market. I have just given you a two or three uh, example instruments. There are much more. As I said, you have to hit at least 600, 500 to 600 words. Uh, so for that, how many ever instruments are required? Uh, plan accordingly and you write okay second part is we have to know about the intermediary so we talked about instruments now we let's talk about a few intermediaries of capital market the first intermediary and i think which will be familiar to most of you is stock exchange stock exchange provides a platform for the trading of securities including the equity instruments and the debt instruments they facilitate price discovery they ensure transparency in transactions and they also maintain markets integrity so you can quote also the examples of prominent stock exchanges like we have the BSC, we have the NSC. When you go to US, you have their own, right? You can quote these things. The second intermediary which we have to know about is the investment banks. Investment banks play a key role in the issuance of new securities through a process called as initial public offerings. Like when any company gets introduced in the stock market you will see if, if you guys have a paper at home at least once or twice even i think a few months back also uh, there was right when uh, companies go public they give an advertisement about the ipos right so that is ipo is nothing but the initial public offering and bond offerings so these are issued using in investment banks okay they assist companies in raising the capital underwriting their securities as well as providing advisory services related to mergers, acquisitions or restructuring. Investment banks also engage in market making activities and contribute to the liquidity of the companies in the or these uh, securities in the secondary market. The third type of intermediaries which I would like to introduce you is brokers and dealers. So brokers and dealers act as intermediaries between investors and the capital market. They facilitate the buying and selling of securities on behalf of their clients, executing trades and providing market related information and analysis. So online uh, brokerage platforms have gained prominence offering retail investors access to the capital market with enhanced convenience and transparency. Depositories and clearing corporations are another type of intermediary. Depositories like uh, National Security Depository Limited or Central Se Depository Services Limited, they provide electronic holding and transfer of securities, eliminating the need for physical share certificates. Clearing corporations ensure this, that the settlement of trades are done by managing counterparty risks and guarantee the completion of transactions. Then we also have credit rating agencies. Credit rating agencies assess the credit worthiness of the issuers and their securities, providing credit ratings which will help investors evaluate the risk that is associated with investing in specific instruments. So these ratings will be influencing the pricing and demand for debt securities in the capital market. Then uh, something which you also have to know about is the regulatory framework on which this capital ma market actually operates. So we talked about the instruments, the inter intermediaries. The question was about the working of the capital market. So when you talk about the working of the capital market, we have to know about how the regulation of this market is being done. So that is why if it is possible, please include a small note about the regulatory framework on which the capital market operates. Okay. So when it comes to capital market, the framework is established by regulatory authorities like SEBI. SEBI is Securities and Exchange Board of India. Okay. SEBI is the uh, authority which oversees the functioning of the capital markets in India. And it ensures that the investors are protected, the, mar the integrity of the market is protected and it also enforces regulations related to securities issuance, trading and disclosure. So overall, you can say the capital market actually serves as a vital source of long term financing and investment opportunities supported by a diverse array of instruments and intermediaries. Its efficient functioning is very much essential for fostering economic growth channeling savings into productive investments and enabling the efficient allocation of capital within our economy. 
Now, that was a short description on how you can answer question number two of MMPC pre assignment. Now, let us move on to the third question. Third question asks us to discuss on how the reforms in the insurance sector have provided a universal social security system, especially to the underprivileged. So, this particular topic is discussed in unit number nine. So, either you read through that or you utilize the detail, detailed video that is provided in the MMPC3 playlist on Anu's classroom. Okay. Either way, get an idea of this particular topic before you start writing the answer. So, reforms in India's insurance sector. This, when you think about insurance sector, Indian insurance sector, what comes into your mind? LIC. That is the first and foremost thing that comes into your mind. Correct? So, historically, the sector, the insurance sector was dominated by the state-owned enterprises like LIC or GIC. And when that was the case, the sector had low insurance penetration to the underprivileged. But then, liberalization and privatization efforts started in early 2000s to, what you can say, make these insurance coverages more reachable to the underprivileged section as well. Okay. So, this liberalization and privatization efforts which started in the early 2000s introduced private players and foreign investments into the sector which were regulated by the IRDAI that was established in 1999. These reforms led to the creation of what is called micro insurances and rural insurance products that were specifically designed for these low income individuals. Then after that, we have a lot of government sponsored schemes that has been recently introduced like Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana, Ayushman Bharat, Pradhan Mantri Arogya Yojana, all these things, variety of them are there. Okay, so if you go to SBI, like recently I went to SBI and they were also pitching for one of these. Uh, I have, uh, um, I had a, uh, what you can say, uh, agent from SIB, South Indian Bank, call me uh, talking about some strength, this kind of a scheme also. So, lot of schemes are there and they are also pitching them to more people. So, um, these type of schemes have also given this coverage, this insurance coverage to the lower underprivileged people. So, you can explain about all of these in, you know, as small, small paragraphs and make your answer, you know, uh, have it, have them in your main answer section. So, if you are to say, if I am to say, if I am to give you a brief on all of these. So, we have the first one is Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana. So, this provided bank accounts with accidental and insurance cover. Like, for example, if you take any uh, account right now, most of them all come up, comes with uh, accidental and life insurance cover already. Like, uh, recently, like, uh, we were discussing with HDFC for a uh, for an investment option and uh, they said that insurance is already part. Even SBA, when we spoke with them, insurance, life insurance, uh, accidental and life insurance cover is already part of most of the uh, plans they are, investment plans we are being offered right now. So, the next one is Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana. This offered life insurance for a nominal annual premium. So, if you go to this Akshaya centers and all you will see, you give 50 rupees every month or like uh, around 300 rupees or so in a year and you will get 1 lakh cover or 5 lakh cover, something like that and all are there right now. Very affordable rates and we get coverage, right? So, those things come through uh, these reforms in the insurance sector. Similarly, this uh, PMSBY. Uh, this provided affordable accidental death cover and disability cover. PMJAY offers substantial health coverage for secondary and tertiary care. So, like that you give a, a shot on all of these various uh, initiatives by the government. It will make up your answer. Okay. Now, also you talk about what are the regulatory measures like the standardization of insurance products, robust grievance redressal mechanisms, including insurance ombudsmans have improved the consumer protection in this particular sector. The integration of technology through digital platforms, Aadhaar linkage, all these things have also made the insurance services more accessible as well as efficient. Additionally, we also have awareness campaigns and collaborations with NGOs which have been instrumental in educating and enrolling the underprivileged people. So that is why I said these awareness campaigns are the part of which I used to see when I go into a bank and they tell me the help desk people, they uh, give a brief about these schemes. So that is part of the awareness campaign. Right. So, these efforts have collectively increased the insurance coverage, reduced the out-of-pocket healthcare expenditures, 
and enhanced the financial stability of the underprivileged people. So that was in short about the insurance sector. Now let us look at the next question. This is the second last question of our assignment. It is asking us about how the theory of absolute advantage is different from the theory of comparative advantage. To know more about these theories, you will have to go through unit number 12 of MMPC3. So either you read your textbook or you utilize the video explanation that is provided in Anu's classroom, whichever way, but make sure you have an idea of it. Once that is done, then along with whatever we are going to cover over here in this particular video, I'm sure you will have no difficulty writing your own assignment answers in no time. So, let us talk about the theory of absolute advantage and the theory of comparative advantage. Now, these are these two theories, they are both fundamental concepts in the field of international trade, but they differ in their focus and their implications for trade. The theory of absolute advantage was proposed by Adam Smith, okay? And it centers around the idea that a country should speci specialize in producing goods in which it has absolute advantage. So what does that mean? It means that the country can produce those goods more efficiently and with higher productivity compared to other countries, okay? So that is like our best, uh, what you can say, skill. You do that. If you are good at singing, uh, but you are okay in da dancing, the theory of absolute advantage says you sing, you don't dance, you sing and make money, okay? An example. So, this theory emphasizes the inherent productivity and efficiency of a country in producing specific goods or services. And according to this theory, a country can benefit from trade by exporting goods in which it has an absolute advantage and importing goods in which it has a relative disadvantage. Okay, so rather than making an average dancer dance and an average singer sing, you make the you make the best singer sing and the best dancer dance. That is theory of absolute advantage. Okay, so this theory highlights basically it highlights the importance of focusing on producing goods where a country has an absolute edge in efficiency. Now coming to the theory of comparative advantage, this was introduced by David Ricardo. Okay, and it takes a different approach by emphasizing that even if a country does not have an absolute advantage in producing any goods, it can still benefit from trade by specializing in and exporting goods in which it has a comparative advantage. Okay, so now what if you are not Lata Mangeshkar or what if you are not Shobhana? Okay, um, why Shobhana? Because I like her dancing style. Okay, um, or what if you are not A. R. Rahman? You are a you are not that great. Now what I will do? Okay. Don't worry. That is what the theory of comparative advantage is. You look around you. Okay. If you are more better at singing than your neighbor, you sing. Or if you are more good at dancing than your neighbor, then you dance. Okay. That is what theory of comparative advantage is. You compare and see which is where you are bet better at. Okay. Than the others. Even if you don't have absolute advantage. Okay. So that is uh, what you can say. That is the comparative advantage theory. It means that a country have to focus on producing and exporting goods in which it has the lowest opportunity cost compared to other countries rather than goods in which it has absolute advantage. Okay, so this theory focuses on the concept of opportunity cost and relative efficiency in production. It suggests that countries have to specialize in the production of goods where they have comparative advantage even if they are not the most efficient producers of those goods. So, you can, uh, if possible, uh, you know, you, you list out the differences between the theory of absolute advantage and the theory of comparative advantage in a tabular form, okay. If possible, if it is possible for you, you make it in a tabular form or at least you make it in two sections, okay, with bullet points. That way, your main answer, the main section of your answer will be much more presentable, okay. So, anyways, then bind up your answer with a short conclusion. You can say like, uh, in summary, the main difference between these two theories, the theory of absolute advantage and the theory of comparative advantage actually lies in their focus, okay. You take the theory of absolute advantage or the theory of comparative advantage, both of them are emphasizing that uh, or both of them are supporting the idea that countries can benefit from trade by specializing in the production of certain goods and then trading with other countries to obtain a diverse range of products at lower opportunity cost, okay. So, the theory of absolute advantage highlights the importance of focusing on goods where a country has absolute efficiency edge, while the theory of comparative advantage underscores the benefits of specializing in goods with the lowest opportunity cost if 
there is no absolute efficiency advantage okay if you are absolutely efficient in something you produce that what if you don't have an absolute efficiency advantage then you produce one which you are comparatively good at that is what these two theories are saying okay so that was about theory of absolute advantage versus relate comparative advantage now the last question of this assignment is a short note question and this short note question has three sub parts okay and the, each of these sub parts or the sub questions are from different units of mmpc3 so let us look at each of these topics one by one and uh, see how we can answer them or what these concepts are all about so the first short note question is about corporate social responsibility now corporate social responsibility is a topic from unit number 4 of mmpc3 let us see how we can write a short note on this corporate social responsibility now so the corporate social responsibility or csr in short refers to a business practice which involves initiatives that are aimed at benefiting the society as well as the environment beyond the company's core business activities or legal requirements okay so it encompasses a wide range of actions and policies which demonstrate a company's commitment to ethical behavior social well-being and environmental stability one of the key aspects of the csr is the consideration of the impact of a company's operations on various stakeholders including its employees consumer customers suppliers communities and the environment so this involves not only complying with the legal obligations but also proactively engaging in activities which contribute to the welfare of all these stakeholders the csr initiatives can take various forms some of the forms could be environmental sustainability or ethical labor practices or community engagement or responsible marketing and consumer protection or governance and ethical business practices or uh, stakeholder engagement so all these things you can write down as uh, what you can say practices csr practices or various csr initiatives so i've just uh, listed down few of them you uh, list down as many as is possible for you to find out and give an explanation of each of these initiatives like when you're talking about environmental sustainability you can say that companies can implement environmental friendly practices to reduce their carbon footprint or minimize their waste stages or conserve their natural resources or support renewable energy initiatives and all okay so it could involve initiatives like energy efficient operation or waste reduction or recycling programs or sustainable sourcing of materials something like that okay so each csr initiative that you can find out give a short description of that as well okay and then finally uh, you can wind up saying that uh, something like uh, the benefit of csr initiatives can be significant including enhanced brand reputation improved employee morale retention or better relationships with the consumers and the communities where the particular company is operating like can you uh, operate in an area if you are having some beef with the community i mean not beef as in not the meat okay if you are having some uh, fight with the community okay so having beef is a term actually it is a slang actually or you can say it is a, a figure of speech in english to say having a beef with someone means having a disagreement or having a conflict or having a problem with that person of course don't say don't write having beef with the community in your term and examination or your assignment sheet okay because that is an informal way of saying it when you are writing an answer script you should say disagreement conflict or problem with the community but uh, if in case you are talking with someone and they use this word uh, or oh, this particular person is having a beef with somebody else don't think that they are going to sit and eat beef for lunch or dinner okay that is not what is said it means that they are in some kind of a conflict that is what it means okay just uh, just uh, quoting it because uh, the phrase came out of my mind, mouth and i wanted you guys to be aware of what it means in case you don't anyway so uh, yeah let us come back to our topic about csr so csr can contribute to addressing the societal challenges and the environmental concerns and making a positive impact beyond the company's immediate operations so it is important to note that csr is not just about uh, philanthropy or public relations okay it should not be it should be integrated into the core of our business strategy and operations because companies which embrace csr as a fundamental part of their business approach are more likely to create a sustainable value for both their stakeholders and the broader society additionally many consumers and investors are also increasingly considering a company's csr practices when making purchasing or investment decisions 
So this further emphasizes the importance of CSR in today's business landscape. So like this, you can write a short note. Since it is a short note, uh, maybe you know uh, you can limit your answer to around uh, 300 to 400 words is fine, but don't make it more shorter. Okay. Now coming to the next sub question here is the banking sector is about banking sector in India. Now banking sector uh, or banking structure in India is part of unit number five. Okay. And so let us see how to write the answer to this particular question. Now the banking sector in India is a crucial component of our country's financial system. It plays a pivotal role in facilitating the economic growth and development of our nation. The sector is quite diverse. It comprises of various types of banks and each type of bank has its own unique characteristic and contributions, right? So you might have seen cooperative banks, you might have seen public banks, private sector banks, uh, all those kinds of banks, right? So what are public sector banks? Public sector banks are majority owned by the government. It has historically been the backbone of our Indian banking system like SBI or Punjab National Bank, Bank of Baroda, all these things, all these banks are public sector banks. The reason why they are public sector bank is the majority share is owned by the government. Okay, And these banks, these public sector banks also have a very widespread presence across the country, particularly in the semi, uh, in the rural and semi-urban areas. They have played a significant role in promoting the financial inclusion and providing banking services to the underserved segments of the population. Then we have banks like ICICI, HDFC, Access Bank and all, right, which have also emerged as formidable players in the Indian banking landscape. These banks are private sector banks and they are known for their efficiency, their customer centric approach and adoption of modern technology. They have been instrumental in introducing innovative banking products and services including personalized wealth management, digital banking solutions and tailored lending products. Then we also have certain foreign banks. What are foreign banks? Foreign banks are banks from abroad who are operating in India to bring a global best practices and expertise to the country's banking sector. Their presence is relatively limited when you compare to the domestic banks, but they cater to the needs of the multinational corporations and the high net worth individuals and specific niche segments. So their focus, the focus of these foreign banks is on the international standards of banking and risk management. And it has also contributed to raising the overall standards of our India's banking industry. Then the most common cooperative and regional rural banks. So cooperative banks and regional rural banks play a vital role in serving the financial needs of rural and agricultural communities. These banks are structured to cater to specific requirements of their local areas and provide agricultural credit or rural development loans or any other financial services which are tailored to the rural economy. Now before we wind up our answer on the banking structure in India, you also have to mention about the regulatory framework of the banking industry in India. So it is the Reserve Bank of India, RBI, which serves as the central regulatory authority for our banking sector. It formulates and implements the monetary policy. It regulates and supervises the banks and maintains financial stability across the nation. The RBI's regulatory framework encompasses prudential norms, capital adequacy requirements and guidelines for risk management that are aimed at ensuring the soundness and stability of our banking system. Also, we said that private banking sector, when we were talking about HDFC and all, we said that they bring newer technologies to banking sector, right? So we also have to, it will be great if you can have a small, uh, you know, two or three lines dedicated to uh, talking about what are the technological advancements that are happening in the banking sector in India. So the Indian banking sector, as we all know, has embraced technological advancements as well. And this has led to the proliferation, uh, proliferation of digital banking services. Now, even uh, the nearby tea shop is also, uh, we can pay them using Google Pay. Even beggars have started saying Google Pay. Once I was going somewhere and somebody, you know, some person, they came up to me. I, I just had my phone with me. They were asking for money and I said, oh, sorry, I don't have my wallet with me. And then the ne next thing was, it's okay, I have Google Pay, you can transfer the money. <laughs> okay, so so that, that widespread, it has become technology. So mobile banking, internet banking, digital payment is there. So all these kind of platforms, they have gained widespread adoption and is offering customers convenient and secure ways to conduct financial transactions. So even fintech collaborations uh, and the implementation of advanced core banking solutions, all these things have further enhanced the efficiency and the reach of our banking services. 
And uh, when you think about it in the recent years also, the Indian banking sector has again undergone significant regulatory reforms to address challenges like non-performing assets or inf insolvency issues and all. Uh, the insolvency and bankruptcy code was introduced uh, recently. It has provided a structure for fra uh, a structured framework for resolving any kind of insolvency insolvency related matters, and it has helped in promoting credit discipline and strengthening the credit culture in our banking system. And additionally, the establishment of the National Company Law Tribunal has facilitated the expeditious resolution. Expeditious resolution means speedy resolution of corporate insolvencies contributing to the overall health of our banking sector. So overall we can say that the banking sector in India continues to evolve. It is driven by a combination of both the regulatory changes, the technology, in, technological innovation and a growing emphasis on financial inclusion. That is why every most every person has a bank account now. right? So the sector's resilience and adaptability are also essential in supporting India's economic aspirations and meeting the diverse financial needs of our population. Now, the last short note question is about Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. This is also the last question in your, uh, what you can say, in your assignment. Okay. So, this about Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan is given de in detail in the appendix section of our unit number 8. Now, let us see how we can write the answer to this particular question. Now, Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan is also known as the Self-Reliant India Mission. Okay, and when it, and when uh, I still remember, I think I had seen its uh, live telecast when uh, PM Modi was first uh, talking about or first introduced this concept of Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. Oh my God, the kind of commotion it produced. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going back to the era before LPG? Uh, things like that. Okay, that is all the ruckus created without knowing what this uh, what the person was saying properly, just by hearing the word Atmanirbhar self reliant means everything, all hell broke loose. So anyway, so this Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, which is also known as the Self-Reliant India Mission, it is an economic stimulus package program as well as a reform program that was launched by the Government of India in May 2020. This initiative was actually introduced in response to the economic challenges that were posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and was aimed to make India more self-reliant and resilient in the face of global disruptions. The key components of this Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan included economic relief measures. Like the government in, uh, announced a range of economic relief measures to support the various sectors of the economy, including the small and medium sized enterprises, the agriculture and healthcare, and all. And these measures included financial assistance, credit support, and regulatory reforms to alleviate the impact of the pandemic on businesses and individuals. Similarly, structural reforms. Uh, so, the structural reforms initiative focused on implementing the structural reforms across stru uh, sectors like the agriculture, defense, mining and civil aviation. And these reforms were aimed at enhancing the efficiency, the competitiveness and self-reliance in these sectors, thereby contributing to the overall goal of building a more resilient economy. Similarly, this uh, self-reliant India mission also promoted local manufacturing. So, it, uh, this Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan emphasized the promotion of local manufacturing and production through initiatives such as Make in India campaign. Okay, Still, you can see, right, now there are a lot more products with Make in India badge. So, the goal here was to reduce the dependence on imports and strengthen the domestic manufacturing capabilities, thereby fostering self-reliance and creating employment opportunities. So, similarly, you can talk about the infrastructure development or self-reliance in the strategic sectors. Uh, and in indigenous capabilities and things like that, like technological advancement, innovation, domestic production, similarly, the global outreach. So, seeking to position India as a reliable and a competitive partner in the global supply chain, all these things were uh, are part of Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. So, you can write about all these things. So, overall, you can say that Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan represents a comprehensive strategy to enhance India's self-reliance and resilience across various economic sectors. And by focusing on the economic relief, structural reforms, the local manufacturing, infrastructure development, strategic self-reliance and global outreach, the initiative seeks to position India as a self-reliant and globally competitive economy that is capable of withstanding the global challenges and disruptions. So, so, the, uh, so with that, we have discussed all the questions that were there in MMPC3 assignment. And as I said in the beginning of our discussion also, if you are writing your own answer or if you have got, bought a bulk assignment answer from any of the many vendors out there, 
please take some effort from your side as well to make your answer stand out from others who may have also purchased from the same vendor as you okay make yours a little bit different from them how can you do that because this is very important if you are aiming for a grade in your assignments and i want all of my anus classroom community members to aim for a grade that is why i am taking all this pain and giving you such videos so how can you do that provide real world examples whenever possible okay and if possible then whatever you are writing okay whatever you have written down if possible then support whatever you have written down or summarize whatever you have written as paragraph pictorically okay in the form of diagrams or tables and uh, if possible organize your answers in points bullet points now uh, when i say about providing real world examples one example of giving a real world example can be like when uh, in you are asked to write about the theory of absolute versus comparative advantage correct that is one of the questions so in the textbook if you look the example given is of computers and roses you know uh, one country is good at uh, producing computers the other is good at producing roses and all don't write that example okay everybody will be writing that example you give something else okay rather than quoting that uh, why not uh, you know do some research and uh, try to quote something from the real world like you take for example usa and saudi arabia or you take india and usa okay if you give a minute's thought about these two countries and think about their comparative and absolute advantage you will realize that it is the theory of absolute advantage which explains why countries like saudi arabia is focusing on oil production while as uh, the theory of comparative advantage will explain why countries like india or the united state uh, states are specializing in the trade of textiles or software services or machinery or pharmaceuticals and all so these trade theories they actually it is straight how countries can benefit from specializing in goods where they hold either an absolute advantage or a compute comparative advantage and engaging in international trade so give examples like that okay similarly while you are talking about csr you can uh, talk about any of the csr initiatives of any organization that you have come, come across now don't tell me you haven't come across any any csr initiatives okay then i'll say you're lying you're lying directly to my face because if you have purchased at least one classmate notebook or one classmate drawing book something one classmate offering or if you have glanced through if you have at least taken it in your hand and you have you know looked at it front cover and back cover you would have come across a csr initiative don't, don't believe me next time you go to a store or if you have somebody's classmate notebook you know lying around you look at it you take it and you look at the back side the back page back cover okay check for yourself and then you comment below what you found from the classmate product okay what csr initiative was written in behind your classmate product you tell me you comment in the comment section below let's see how many of you will get it how many different csr initiatives will come up okay so like that try to make your answers stand out from the crowd okay that is what basically i'm trying to say here then as i regularly say it is always good to divide your answers into sections or subsections which will be easier for comprehension as well so if you make your invigilators life easy and you have substantial points chances are unless they are in a real big uh, messy situation where they are totally screwed up you will be given a grades okay so uh, even you can even think about underlining the important points as well that will also be very good okay so with that let us wind up the discussion on this particular assignment if you have reached so far then thank you so much so so much to for investing your time in anus classroom i hope it was worth it and if you are new to the channel then do look around there are many videos that are created especially for igno mba students like yourself and if you did like my content then please support me with your likes your shares and subscriptions and if you enable notifications while you subscribe to the channel then youtube will notify you each time a new video is uploaded on the channel so i hope to see you around happy learning